All right, let's get this show on the road. Thank you for joining us. My name is Lisa Johnson, and I'm the founder and executive director of Private School Village. I have the privilege of getting this conversation started tonight. With this event, PSV launches the Trustee Leadership Program, and in many respects, this program is one of our most important as the role of a trustee is paramount to the success of organizations like PSV and our mission to transform the private school experience for our families so that children fully thrive. This program has two key groups. On one side, you have uh, parents who are already trustees in our schools. And on the other side, you have those who are interested in serving. PSV will be providing regular opportunities for current trustees to connect, build resources and support, and ultimately work together to make sure we're each making the most of our service and ideally able to pass the baton to trustees who share in our desire to support our community to the fullest. This is also for those who aspire to sit on boards. We'll provide trainings much like the one tonight to educate and inform you about what it means to be a good trustee so that when you have the opportunity, you can hit the ground running with confidence and with ease. Um, and we hope to build a pipeline so that the PSV community is a strong community to go to for strong service when there's a need. We also will provide those who are interested in serving on corporate boards the opportunity to learn more about positioning for that too down the line. We've established a partnership with the African American Board Leadership Institute to sponsor a number of parents to participate in their more extensive training programs. So after the holiday, if you've signed up to participate in the program, please be on the lookout for an email with additional information about how to be engaged. But tonight, we're gonna to hear from two powerhouses that need very little introduction. Joining us is Mariama Richards, who's the Associate Head of School at Crossroads School for Arts and Sciences. Mariama majored in history at Spelman College and Africana Studies at Cornell University before beginning her career as a humanities teacher in DC public schools. She then went on to serve in various administrative roles at several independent schools um, on the East Coast, um, including Georgetown Day School. Dr. Elizabeth Denevi is no stranger to our community. She has been featured on a few of our webinars before, which you can always check out on our YouTube channel. She's always a wise advisor and mentor to me, so I'm forever grateful for that. She's director of East Ed and co-founder of Teaching While White. She's also the author of a yet to be released book entitled uh, Learning and Teaching While White, Building Anti-Racist School Communities. Excellent. And that's going to be available when? Uh, if we get paper and ink sometime soon, probably out of the port of Long Beach, uh, hoping for summer 20, 2022. Excellent. Excellent. So we'll be sure to check that out. So I'm gonna ask you ladies to take it away. And then when you're ready, um, we've already discussed, I will have a, a slew of questions for you. We will be using the Q&A feature tonight. So if you have questions as you hear them speaking, jot them down in the Q&A feature. I will be monitoring them, um, monitoring that. And then when they're finished uh, presenting, we'll go to those questions, ladies. Hello, everyone. Um, I want to start off by giving a shout out to my Spelman sister who I see in the, in the room, Cara Greer Johnson, um, as well as a shout out to all my wonderful Crossroads folks that are on here tonight. Um, Maisha, I see you. Um, and um, we're so pleased to be here with you. Uh, one, because we're really um, dedicated to doing this work. Um, we believe that uh, looking at the Board of Trustees is the most important way to determine how a school will function. Um, and how it will show what its real value is and how it values uh, the community before them. Um, Elizabeth and I worked together for 10 years at Georgetown Day School. And so we do a lot of shorthand. So just be prepared for that for this evening. Um, but I think you're gonna come away thinking, all right, I know what I need to do. And uh, you'll feel really good about what questions you need to ask at the bare minimum. So we're so excited to be here with you all tonight. Um, and we can go into the first slide. Unless Elizabeth, do you want to start off by saying anything? Uh, no, I will just say good evening, everyone. It's great to be with you. And uh, I'll hand it back to you. All right, awesome. 
So most of you know that in terms of a board of trustees, they have three areas of responsibility. One is to recruit and retain a head of school. Um, my school just got finished going through a head search, um, very exhaustive process. Um, where often subcommittees are created, um, and it really is an opportunity to think about what the future of the school is. So they have a huge responsibility on their hands to be able to make sure that the future of the school is solid and that they have leadership that really speaks to what they desire in the school community. Um, they are also the keepers of the mission, um, in particular the strategic plan. Um, Elizabeth and I think a lot about strategic plans in part because the role that we had at Georgetown Day School was created because of the strategic plan. I think we were one of the first offices in the country that had co-directors of diversity, uh, namely there to represent folks of color and white people to really engage the entire community around what we felt like diversity, equity, and justice would still look like at our school. And so in creating those plans, enacting them, um, again, one of the key areas of making sure that the school is aligned with what it is and who they say they are. Um, and then lastly, are always the fiduciary responsibilities, uh, the budgetary responsibilities, um, and often, um, and we'll talk more about kind of how that plays out on most boards, um, but it's important to note that there are key members of the of the board that are chosen specifically because of their expertise in those areas. Um, and often there and within a board of trustees, you can have almost two to three uh, subcommittees of a board that just deal with the finances of an institution. Um, whether it is from fundraising, whether it is investment, whether it is, in our case, real estate, um, or other areas that help to maintain the health and wellness of a school community, in part because so many schools are tuition dependent, that they really have to focus in on what it is that they want to do to maintain uh, the endowment, as well as to uh, make sure that annual fund is met every year. You can go next slide, Lisa. Or no, do Elizabeth. <laughs> do you want to, um, Mariama, did you want to mention the bylaws here? Oh, yes. Oh, thank you. Um, so every board of trustees, most, although we have come across some interesting boards, <laughs> um, have um, bylaws. And those are the rules and responsibility of the board of trustees. Um, and they're very clear around what should happen. So for instance, one of the most important things in a bylaw is the term limit for a trustee. So how long someone can be on the board of trustees. It also has a lot to do with how it dictates your behavior. What are your responsibilities to the board? How should meetings be processed? How should they move forward? Um, who should be connected to them? So during, for example, during our time at Georgetown Day School, um, Georgetown Day was founded essentially as a cooperative school initially. And so for most of our time at the school, all of our board meetings were open. So anyone could attend. And that was a part of the bylaws of the institution. Or I've worked at a Quaker school where at least 40% of the board members had to identify as Quaker. So within your bylaws, you're gonna have very specific rules around who can be a part of the, um, the group, as well as what the, you know, well, the who, the when, the why, and like how the meetings um, are performed. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Next one. Sure, great. So I'm going to talk specifically about this first um, pillar that we want to talk about of these roles and responsibilities of the board. And that's really around recruiting and retaining the head of school because uh, you want to bring somebody in and you want to make sure they stay. Um, and it's important to remember that the board is basically the boss of the head of school. Um, the head of school is, uh, they are responsible. Um, that 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 is the level of responsibility. Um, so as Mari is saying, it's a really, really important job. So as we think about um, really making sure that we are supporting families around racial equity and issues of diversity and social justice to make sure that in particular Black families and students of color um, are thriving in the school community. One thing is, does the head of school have time to work on those issues? Um, it really has to be a part of the job description um, and that it's said there because a head has a lot of things to do, <laughs> a lot of pull on their time. And if there's not something specifically that they are to be working on a sense of belonging for students of color, then it becomes very difficult for them to prioritize that kind of work in the school. 
The other thing is the board can help to make sure that the head of school has the necessary support to be able to do that work. So what does administrative support look like? Um, who are helping to create programming to support different things that are happening in the school, whatever it will may be. And you, does the head have the kind of resources that they need? Um, thinking about not just money, but also personnel. And what connections do board members have to community organizations, to folks working in the community on issues of racial justice, who you might be able then to connect to the school to help out that way. So it becomes a really, really important um, uh, facet of being able to support this work. And really importantly, the board conducts the evaluation of the head of school. And again, Mari and I have seen a lot of different ways that this is done, sometimes very well, other times not as well. Um, it should be a robust, reflective evaluation. We're going to talk more about evaluation, but it's a critical component. It is really important feedback, and the board should direct and support that process, um, hopefully de deciding on those steps or starting to co-create that process with the head of school, but it should be robust and it should happen annually. All right, Mari, I'm going to pass it back to you. All right, so obviously governance, um, the important piece is that they are keepers of the mission, right? Um, and when we're talking about issues of diversity and multiculturalism, we wanna make sure that they understand how diversity supports academic excellence. That's a lot of the work that Elizabeth and I have done with, um, with boards in particular, um, because they are often focused on the fiscal part of their responsibilities. They don't often understand why financially there should be money put towards equity and justice initiatives on campus, or they feel like it might be taking from something else. So we have been engaged in conversations with board members who are like, well, why are we spending all this money on um, additional supports for students who cannot afford to attend this institution? It's taking away from this or it's moving this. And we feel like we're moving and shuffling folks and we don't understand why this is something important. So one of the pieces that we've been really clear about in talking to leaders around the country is that until everyone is on the same page, that diversity equals academic excellence, then we will struggle. I'm gonna repeat that. Until we recognize that diversity equals academic excellence, we will struggle. There is so much research out there now. I mean, we can, within a business context, within school context, within community and belonging context, to show that the more diverse the community is there, that the more learning and growth takes place, right? That the sense of um, awareness, connection is so important. And I want to qualify by this sense of saying it just doesn't mean bringing people there and hoping they thrive. It's the bringing people there, assisting in the ways in which they can thrive. And by being keepers of the mission, it's important for the board to hold the head of school and his or her team responsible for how that plays out in the community, right? Um, the other piece is that when we look at, in, our, in the case of our school, we have a philosophy. We don't have a mission um, or vision. Um, it's very progressive school, long <laughs> philosophies, um, that they really have to understand that and think critically about that with each move we make. So for instance, you know, our board has been having conversations about when subcommittees make decisions and they are probably the most responsible and thought partners for making that decision. How soon or how often do they need to bring those decisions back to the full group? Because that full group is there to actually maybe handle things that that subcommittee doesn't understand. Does that make sense? So that if we have filled the board with say finance folks or lawyer folks, but then also education folks, also community guided people. And sometimes we wanna make sure that the decisions of the finance people are in alignment with the folks who understand education or who understand how we should be connected to the, um, to the community. So it's important that yes, subcommittees exist and making sure that a healthy board knows that even though subcommittees often make the final decisions, that a lot of the conversation needs to also help and happen in the full room. Um, and the other piece is how the board actually understands how to engage resistance. Um, a lot of the moments where we have to go in and talk about boards that are in conflict is often because the board is allowing the community uh, to inform their ear rather than asking real deep questions of what's happening within the school community, right? So as initiatives move forward, 
Um, many of you, I'm sure, have understood what's been happening in terms of the uh, this ridiculous conversation about critical race theory and people's lack of understanding of it. We've seen many of a school really fall apart because they listened to um, some constituents that didn't understand the greater context for what was going on. And rather than um, asking um, within the context of the school community and understanding more about what's there. So with that you know, uh, responsibility of keeping the mission, there is also a really important thing of keeping silent. Like a lot of what we have to do is to help boards to understand that you're listening con to constituents and then you're bringing everything back to the board and then you can let out all your feelings. But to engage a uh, one-on-one -on, -one on the side with folks is really counterintuitive to what many bylaws say around what you have to do to be a successful board member. Great. That's me, my bad. So of the three sort of main areas we were talking about, I'm gonna talk just a little bit, this notion of um, the fiduciary responsibilities. One thing that you have to do as a board is to manage risk. Um, that's a huge part of what's happening. You want to have, you are always looking to the long term, both the short term, also the long term health of the school. Um, so always having to balance. And that's why you want to have, as Mari was talking about, the mission at the center of your decisions so that it's really being guided for what the school stands for. Um, of course, with financial stability, it's very important. We need to have a balanced budget, um, as Mari was saying, especially since most most independent schools are tuition dependent, um, having to really be sure that the school is, is standing on strong financial ground, but also remembering what's the cost of inequality um, to a community. Um, when you have um, school constituents who don't feel like they're seen or valued by the school, those folks don't give to the annual fund. <laughs> um, they are not going to make long-term commitments or estate planning for the school. They're going to come in, get their education, get out, and never look back. So a big part of this piece is really making sure that folks are having the kind of experience in the school where they are feeling like the school is theirs. They are a part of the community. And if things do occur, occur the school has policies and procedures in place to manage those issues of inequity that may be happening, clear directed plans for where things will be reported, how they will be handled. And, you know, of course, a board is not involved in the day to day operations of the school. That is why you have a head of school and administrative team. They are responsible for the day to day implementation. But the hope is, is that the board is working closely with the head of school to ensure those processes are in place. Um, it is important for board members in that notion to stay in their lane. Um, I think that they do have to be mindful of that generally you are 30,000 feet out, you know, sort of looking down, um, trying to have the long view on the landscape. Um, but we also have the little or not in there because as we know, there can particular crises or things that emerge. And if there is a feeling that the leadership is not responding in a way that feels mission centric, that is managing risk, that is keeping the best part of the um, what the school needs to stand for at the center, then the board does have a responsibility then um, to move forward and, and to make sure um, that those things are being taken care of. Do you wanna to add to that Mariama before we go to the next one? Um, I just want to maybe focus a little bit on the managing risk because that those are the moments where the board may get more in, um, involved in the day-to-day -day things that are happening. Uh, for instance, for many of us last year and the year before when uh, the Black ad accounts were rising up um, in many of our communities, that was when the board was um, brought in and asked to really lean in and take responsibility for the history of the school. Um, I can just speak for a crossroads and during our town hall, um, not only were all of our board members there to listen to our black students, but all of our past heads of school were also there to listen to our students. And that was really important um, to our current head, but it was also very important to our board chair. And so that alliance um, was, was uh, there. That is what prompted the letters we sent out. And so th in those moments, because it has to do with risk, it has to do with the legacy of the institution, it has to do with really, did we again live up to our mission? Those are the ways that boards can often be involved on the day to day. Okay. Oh, board structures. <laughs> they can be very different. 
Um, so often there are subcommittees of the Board of Trustees. Um, those subcommittees um, can cover everything. Um, uh, they're often, like I said, um, financial ones that are there, investment. Um, uh, there's also, um, there are always going to be committees that are there specifically for board composition. Um, so many boards have a board, have a board committee to focus on recruiting and growing the capacity of their board over time. So many of you ask questions about how does one get on a board? where often there are a group of board members um, and often folks connected specifically to their development office who are looking in the uh, listing of those who have been involved with the school or new families to the school. And they're looking to actually see who is in the space and how they can make a determination of who should be in the pipeline. Um, so depending on the school, sometimes that can be um, a way in which people will um, jump onto a board committee as a first step before they're actually brought onto the full board of trustees. Um, there are times in which um, that governance committee um, is just kind of uh, creating little side projects for those members to see whether or not they move forward in that way. It's kind of an early vetting um, process. But other board committees that can happen um, can go everything from the strategic planning process um, to areas around um, school mission and um, engagement. Um, and obviously, one of um, the committees that can often be controversial is whether or not you should or shouldn't have a diversity committee. Um, or um, And that changes. There are some actually some really good articles, um, mostly from Independent School Magazine, uh, which make the case for a board diversity committee. Um, and we have seen those committees work really well in some circumstances and other times spin because they don't actually know what they're responsible for. And this can be one of the indications of where boards can sometimes um, go, are we getting too involved or not? Um, I can give you an example of a board um, task that happened um, at a uh, board diversity committee meeting or group that Elizabeth and I were um, um, on at one point was that, for instance, they had a lot of data suggesting that there was a problem with the pipeline of bringing students of color to the highest levels of math and, um, and science. And it was information that we gathered while going through the strategic planning process. Um, and so our board diversity committee tasked the school with finding out whether or not that was true. Um, and so they helped us define a statistician they helped to come up with questions. We then identified teachers that would lead that study and then they stepped away, right? So they don't have their hands in what's happening now. They have just empowered the school to move forward in that task. They did that task, they brought that data back, shared it with the um, board diversity committee. And at that point, we made decisions about then how the school would address it, right? And they made recommendations about what they would have liked to have seen, but they knew at that point that it was turning over to us. Obviously, I've spoken about the strategic planning process and that's a very big deal for boards and for schools because what folks often don't talk about is that once something is in a strategic plan, then that means that the school has to accomplish it. And that's why it's so important that if there are initiatives that are really key to supporting key members of the community or initiatives that we think are, um, are really necessary right now, getting it into the strategic plan is one of the best ways to ensure that it has to be completed or done. Um, I spoke a little bit about board composition, um, but in short, they're often just finding people with different skills. And they want to be able to make sure that those skills um, create a variety enough of experiences so that with any possible question or concern that could come up, there is some form of expertise in the room that can respond to it. Um, there was a question in some of the, um, the uh, some of the questions we received in advance about do you have to be associated with a school to end up on its board? No, you don't. There are a lot of very high powered um, boarding schools in particular that have and colleges and universities that often have people that come from different spaces of industry that they think are really important um, for the institution, but that person may or may not have an actual connection to the school itself. Um, data collection, um, we've mentioned a little bit about evaluation, 
Um, and I think we're going to go into that and later, though, because um, I don't need to talk about that now, Elizabeth, right? Um, yeah. that, that, you know, it's important that not only is the board looking at itself and reflecting on itself, but it also should be actively asking the school to do data collection as well. So similar to the project that I just talked about, you need to ask the, um, the school, how can you prove that this is happening? So when I was the director, well, I was a director of progressive and multicultural education, and then later as an assistant head, I had to do annual reports to the board of trustees around my hiring goals, around the demographics of that hiring, about how many different people I brought in for each thing. And I had to show them the data over the course of three to five years. Um, that was an annual thing that I had to do for our board of trustees so they could make sure that we were going in the right direction. The same thing should be happening with your enrollment team around who they're bringing into the schools in terms of the families. Great. Um, Mari, just the one thing I want to add about board composition too is that as Mari talked about in the bylaws, you know, sometimes certain board seats are set aside for particular constituents. So one thing is that oftentimes they do have seats for alums. So you could also think about, are you an alumni of an institution and then having a seat for that? Some schools are very heavy on current parents. Other schools want to have past parents or don't care if, you're a, if you've ever been a parent. Some folks specifically say to have a community member. Um, they want to have somebody who is, who is intentionally outside of the school community, right, who will, who will bring in another point of view. So again, checking the bylaws to have a sense of um, what that composition looks like. And, and Mari and I have generally found that greater diversity on a board, um, when you think about not just around racial identity, but also around roles, will also also enhance the conversation around the table. If it is a board made up of only current parents, they are going to have a very particular view and very particular desires and wants, and oftentimes can have a hard time, not always, but sometimes it can be hard to be thinking about their thinking beyond their immediate child's experience, um, day to day experience that's happening. And if you are going to serve on a board, you do have to know that you are on there for the bigger picture in the long haul, and you may be supporting initiatives advocating, voting, researching things that your child may graduate and move out of the school before there's any fruit of that labor. Um, and so just, just knowing that as well, that that is sort of a piece of this entire sort of governance puzzle that we're putting forward for you. Great. Um, I wanted to share this um, piece, and this is out of um, Visions, an amazing social justice uh, group in LA. Some of you may be aware of their work. They've done a lot of work in independent schools um, across, uh, across California. But it's really important to remember that, especially for families of color who really are thinking about the ways that racism can show up in schools and, and how we want to, how those families want to work to sort of challenge any kinds of stereotype threat, microaggressions, or outright racism that is operating, it happens in a number of places. As you look at this chart, clearly boards sit at the institutional level, right? They are making policies and procedures. They're setting up rules and systems. And they're working closely with administrators who are doing that same kind of work. They're working with the parent association. But boards are not immune from cultural um, things that are happening. As Mari spoke about the Black At movement that moved across the United States, there was no way that schools or boards could stand silent in this huge cultural uh, moment that was happening. And so those cultural influences will happen. But also additionally, thinking about interpersonal relationships on the board, because a lot of things come through dialogue and discussion. Boards are talking through things. They're trying to figure out what the best decision is to make. So there's a lot of both interpersonal work that happens, building connections, understanding where folks are coming from on the board. And there may be personal work that board members need to do to get up to speed, to make sure that they understand things um, or, it, or things that might be happening in the school that are very different from their their own individual lived experiences. So all of these things are operating at once um, and paying particular attention to how these different levels may be operating or influencing the board is really important. Okay. The questions. Your questions. We got really good questions, everybody. Thank you. You want me just to reveal these one at a time, Mari, and we'll just sort yeah. of hit them? Let's do it. Okay. So we talked a little bit about how you get on a board of trustees. Often it is about 
folks seeing you in the pipeline. Um, and so although there are lots of ways that folks get on in, in the context of their connections, their work, um, a lot of people think that it's financial. Um, but depending on the kind of school that you're at, there's often um, a real desire to get parent volunteers also on the board. So then it's not just about kind of, you know, again, the moneyed people or the lawyer folks, but there's also this great part that is around how can you bring the community dynamic onto the board? Um, and most really healthy boards want to have a combination of those things. Um, so really trying to understand what it means to get into the pipeline is the easiest and best way for you to get on the board of trustees. Uh, the time commitment can vary uh, because it has to do with which board committees you end up on or how many people are on your board of trustees. So there's some boards that are way too big, if you ask me. Um, you know, I was at a school in New York City who had like 35 members on their board of trustees. It was too much, too much you know. Um, but as Elizabeth stated, they also had a responsibility. There were seats that had to be set aside for certain constituents. And as they wanted to build the expertise of the board, the board got bigger, knowing that they had to maintain these by the bylaws. Um, but so it depends on how many subcommittees you're on, uh, but most boards have um, a meeting once a month um, and often a retreat, if not once, but twice a year. Great. But also many emergency calls, <laughs> uh, many, like everybody's got to get on a webinar right now. So, yeah. you know, that's, that's the general time commitment, but it can change rapidly. Also um, listed in the bylaws, as Mari talked about, will be this issue of, of your term um, as a board member. Sometimes those terms are renewable. Um, some boards you term out, so maybe you might get three two-year terms, so you can serve for six years total, and then you have to get off. Then sometimes they'll let you back on again. Um, it really depends. Other, other schools do not even have term limits. So once you're on the board, you're on the board as long as you want to be on it. Um, usually there's some kind of time frame there, but it is, I would, I would expect if you're going in, it is probably at minimum a two-year commitment. Do you think that's fair to say? Maura? That is fair to say, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think this notion about how do you add value once you make it on a board, um, you know, I think to me, it's it's showing how you live the mission. Um, the center part of what a board should do is really living the mission. You picked the school where your child is. Chances are you feel very connected to that community. And so bringing that vision and your experience, how, how that shows up in the community and really what you think the school stands for, you bring that representation to the board, that bigger picture piece. Um, and so I think being able to hold the larger community, um, I think, as well if you are reaching out um, if you've had a chance to volunteer for different events that maybe having it haven't that ha happen at the school then you're able to bring those diverse experiences um, when you might have been working a particular event or heard different kinds of things um, but really the the value that you add is to help the school live its very best life and there's a lot of different ways you can do that do you want to add to that mariama um, so I know this sounds reckless, but there are many times where we go show up at board meetings and folks have not read the supporting documents. Um, and you can tell that they haven't because of some of the questions that they might ask um, and this level of comfort they have, like I'll be able to understand what's happening once I get there. Please read the documents. Um, please um, engage with the literature that's been given to you because um, it often will reveal things to you that you didn't know were happening or that you need to know more information about. And sometimes a board chair and a head of school can believe you were informed because they gave you something, but without that deep reading, you may miss out on something really important. All right, so how does the school culture impact board priorities? Well, we gave you one example of how it does with Black Act, right? It changed kind of what a priority of the Board of Trustees was and how they could make a very clear statement about where they stand on certain initiatives. Um, but what can often happen um, is that they are too listening to the community, right? And this is the way in which we say that like, you gotta make sure you keep your ears open and maybe your mouth more um, closed because you're actually looking for the um, 
the community pulse when you're out there. And if there are questions that seem to peak or continue to uh, come around, these are opportunities where you can approach the head of school or the board chair or, or other members of the board of trustees around what it is you're hearing and how you can move that forward. Um, so the culture absolutely dictates it um, because you can determine as a school, are you really ready to build a new building when it feels like people are very upset about a curricular change? Does that make you know? Does that make sense, right? Or um, determining that although you think that the school should really overhaul its schedule and that was a part of the strategic plan, given the the weight of COVID right now, we need to put that off for three years. So in those ways, the culture and what's happening largely can have an impact on what your board prioritizes. Great. How are boards held accountable? <laughs> well, one way is that boards do have to go through an audit. So it is really important around the budget and all of the finances, all of that has an external audit. Um, so at least there is a, there's sort of a double check on those decisions. Of course, when you're dealing with, a, in the most case of most schools, multi-million dollar budgets, right? Um, those have to be carefully um, audited and looked at by external means. Um, the other piece that I would say is boards really should engage in a self-evaluation process. It's really important that they take time to reflect in meaningful ways um, about how they are working together as a board. So sort of that, interna that interpersonal level that we were talking about. Um, and then how are they doing on sort of that of, of, of the policies and things they move forward? Are they aligned with the school's mission? Where are they seeing that happening? Um, they should also be, be on a regular basis gathering feedback from the community. <laughs> so it's not just, oh, we think we're doing a great job, um, but you actually have evidence um, um, to that and really making sure that when you do this is probably um, we're, we have one of the questions it was a great question here what's one of the biggest mistakes um, that boards will make one mistake the boards will make is they will gather feedback but they will not disaggregate that feedback by race and so if you're especially as a black family <laughs> want to know what's happening for families of color if you just have feedback in general from families but that's not disaggregated by race, perhaps by gender identity and expression, perhaps by zip code, right? Um, uh, sometimes you'll know age of children. So it might be, oh, here are the lower school parents or here are the high school parents. But disaggregating that feedback so you really know which communities are having what kind of experience. Um, and so that's that, that to me is another really important way that bo boards have accountability. Um, what else, Mariana? I'll just add one piece, which is how the board is, um, how people understand who's a member of the board of trustees is really important. Um, for some schools, they'll have pictures and names on the website. Sometimes it'll be a part of, um, you know, experience. Um, you know, we've often encouraged members of our board to attend community events, um, even when they no longer have students at our school, um, so that they can be seen. Um, and I think the more people are kind of infused into the community, the more um, they feel a responsibility to the folks that they're connected with. Yes, I think we answered that, no. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, so back to biggest mistakes. So that was one thing I was thinking about was, um, was the issue of data collection and not disaggregating feedback. Um, I think another mistake um, that I've seen boards make is to um, get too insulated from the community. This speaks a little bit to what Mari is talking about um, and getting so involved with their work that they're doing, um, not paying enough attention to what's happening in the community. So that notion of visibility and being out there and being present and showing up for events, this goes back to the time commitment piece. Um, I've known where boards have asked or board members have signed up, they've looked at school calendars of the events that are gonna happen for the year and they make sure there's at least three or four board members at every event. So it's not that everybody has to go to everything, but they know at each event, there's been a great representation of trustees to the point that Mari said, so that you're visible, so folks see the work that you're doing. But most importantly, when you're sitting back at the trustee table and you have to make a decision, you've heard from students or you've heard from teachers or you've had the opportunity to talk to other parents about what may be going on. Um, other mistakes, Mari, that you've seen? No, let's move on. I think we have one more slide and I know that Lisa had some questions. Oh, sorry. How does a board prioritize uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice? 
and support students of color? Well, one, I think it's the data collection. So again, asking those questions, what's your percentage in these certain areas? How can you um, tell that there's levels of success? Um, have you looked at that over time? Are there trends? So again, asking really high level questions of your, of your board, um, but that really get to um, you know, an analysis of where the culture is and what we've been able to see in terms of product. Schools pride themselves on being exceptional institutions, but if we can see um, an oddity or something that plays out, it's a, one of the ways that we can show where inequality uh, functions. So as an example, one of the, the weirdest things that happens in many independent schools is that mostly, you know, black kids are, are often not great test takers. I don't wanna make a huge generalization here, but we are not necessarily known as those who are the great test takers, right? But we often see in independent schools, this layer where the students will get great test scores and then their grades do not align. And that makes zero sense. Right. So then you have a real good conversation that you can have between if this kid is testing at this level, why do their grades look like that? And then you get into longer, more complicated spaces around the culture of the classroom, how that student is being seen on campus, asking simple questions to align between what are the trends in our test scores and what are the grades here are one of the ways that we can actually see whether or not we actually are, fun we're fundamentally living up to what it say, what our promise is to students and to families. Great. So we have just one last um, slide that we wanted to share because there were particular questions about folks um, who are serving as black trustees. Um, and so um, Mari, you wanna, we can, we'll walk, I think we have three more to walk through Lisa and then we'll be ready to, to open it up. What if Black families in my school are not on the same page? Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I was about to say something flipped that my grandmother used to say to me, which is not all your skin folk are your kin folk. Um, and so um, I always feel like it's really important for the school to make a decision about what its priorities are rather than negotiating out folks who may still be trying to figure out how they'll function in the community as people of color. So for instance, um, Elizabeth and I have been running racial affinity groups for years. There are always gonna be folks of color who are in opposition to affinity groups who say things like that is segregation or we want our kids to understand what it's like to go to school with others. That's why we brought them here. Again, you stay true to what it is that you feel like the school needs and there are, there's lots of research around different forms of equity and justice work that may work for some and not others. Everything's not mandatory, but what you do and what you need to show you do as an institution is important. So and it's less about kind of what people, you know, it's best practice. And you can take that moment to focus on best practice and not necessarily on what community members are saying. Um, what are the main challenges Black trustees face and what do you suggest for them to be successful? Um, one of the things that, that I've heard is, you know, Black trustees being under a kind of stereotype threat that they arrive on the board and having to hear, hear from other folks like, it's so great to have you here. Um, boy, we, you know, we really needed, you know, another Black trustee. I mean, that notion of that you're there to fill some kind of quota. And so I think part of it is sometimes the challenge is not with the black trustee, it's with <laughs> challenging either the stereotypical um, or biased beliefs of other board members who may believe you only got there because of the color of your skin. Of course, it's the same thing that black kids face uh, uh, in academics as well, sometimes arriving place and assuming that's the only thing that happened. I think being able to talk about this notion of stereotype threat to know that that's operating um, and to be able to have space Places where, where that can be challenged. Again, that the Black trustees aren't having to bring it up, but boards are aware that bias can be operating. And so I think paying attention to that. Um, and I think if, if you're interviewing for a board, usually there'll be a process um, when you're in a pipeline and being talked to, I think asking about, you know, so how how has the board talked about issues of stereotypes and bias? Have they been through any kind of training? Do they talk about how that might show up at the board level? That's a great question for a black trustee to ask or a, a, a candidate um, to sort of be able to think about like, what are you walking into, right? Have these folks done a little work on this or has there been no conversation? So you sort of know how to position yourself. Yes. Mari? Um, and the other piece is um, looking at what subcommittees they put you on. 
um, because um, I personally feel like there's often um, a decision made to kind of put certain people on certain subcommittees where they're the, but the power brokers are the power brokers around money. And so it's important that even if your expertise doesn't fall in a certain space, like we have a responsibility on our board that folks um, who maybe are not even in finance or operations, that they have to be involved with one of our finance and operations subcommittees in the first term. So they can also just understand that. And that puts you closer to, uh, to be honest with you, power brokers within the school and on the board, so that when there are issues that you think are super important, that you have relationships with them already so that they can be allies with you when you're uh, working on those pieces. So really ask questions about why you're putting on, what why you're being put on certain committees um, and try to get yourself on ones that you know uh, leverage a lot of weight. Great. Um, and then the last question we had was, um, what if there are some trustees of color who are not supporting the current needs of family, students, faculty, and staff? Um, we've spoken to this a little bit, I think always bringing back to what the purpose of the school is, what the mission is. Um, so it's not about what individual folks feel about something in particular. Um, but I do think um, really thinking about then how is that information, how are current needs, how is that being brought to the board? Are you not hearing enough from what's happening in the school? Do you need more information coming forward? Um, <clears throat> You want to add any more to that, Maury? No, I mean, I think it's hard because it really has it to do with the bylaws, of the, you know, and, and, and maybe folks want them on the board because they're going to be silent and they're more of a, a representation rather than um, uh, moving the work forward. So it's hard, right? I don't, I don't, you can't really make a decision about that. You can just kind of keep your fingers crossed and, and have them move off the board. Um, but really also it may be building a relationship with them and understanding more about why they are still on the board and what do they know about what's happening in the community. That's great. Um, excellent. We talked a lot more than 10 minutes, Elizabeth. I know we went way over Lisa. I'm sorry. No, I that's fine. I just have about 10 to 15 more questions that are so juicy and so good that I want I want to try and get to them. So I'm just going to go right in. Okay. Um, this was asked twice tonight on on while you were talking. How can boards push for support of hiring BIPOC teachers and staff and increasing BIPOC admissions while also staying in their lane? <laughs> Well, um, so Elizabeth and I are pretty obsessed with hiring. And one of the things that angers me the most is when schools say they can't find teachers of color, um, which is like the most ridiculous statement ever made. Um, the question is, where are they looking? And how are they prioritizing it? And what extra efforts are being made? Um, and that is in part financial. Um, so looking at your recruitment budget, asking questions about where and how that recruitment budget is being spent. Um, as a school, we have a pretty substantial recruitment budget, and, um, and we make a really, you know, I make an effort to show this is where I'm spending it over the course of um, certain years. Um, I would ask questions about what fairs they're going to. You know, how, I, those are questions about the importance of a budgetary line. Right. So um, so that is really key. Right. Um, so you, you can ask the right questions that are structural. Um, and then I would say asking the school to give you an annual report on what that hiring process has look, looked like and asking for their goals specifically in the area of folks of color. Um, and I often would disaggregate my data by gender, identity and expression, by, um, by race. Um, uh, I would also indicate how many people I interviewed for the position. Um, and talk about that pool of who I interviewed as well as who we eventually hired. I also think Mari and I have also been in schools where especially board members of color were so welcoming and actually helped to either sponsor events or support. They were part of the retention of, faculty, of, of both new faculty and staff of color coming in and current faculty of color. And so I think having that positive relationship there to say, we see you, 
We know you're here. Um, we know how hard you're working. Um, but really being also a method, a, a, you know, a potential pillar of support for folks um, and being a part of that affinity space, I think can be really positive as well. Um, especially if you don't have the kind of representation, you don't have the numbers that you want to have. Being able to bring every all those various constituents together, um, I think, are really powerful in the service of the school. And I think it can be great, sort of almost like an ambassador role for trustees in those moments. Yes. Um, can you speak a little bit more about you said Mariama asking for? I think those two words are really powerful because a lot of times boards get there and they're presented to. Correct. And so can you speak to a little bit more about the responsibility of then taking that on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So again, this goes back to some of the subcommittee work you might be doing, right? So if you look at the pillars that come out of your plan, this may be an opportunity to say, how have we shown growth in these areas? So many plans will say things like, you know, uh, be more inclusive to the wider community, these vague things that mean nothing, right? And so, now you actually have the opportunity to get some meat around that to say, well, so what, what are the questions that you all are asking to determine how you've gotten to that, um, that success? Right. Well, and you mentioned earlier, getting stuff into the strategic plan is a way to make sure stuff has to get done, which I love. Yeah. But the question there is how vague or specific can you push them to be? <laughs> so in a lot of ways, you are saying this is the question that's before us, or this is the goal that's before us, and you're letting the school determine it. But in many cases, like for instance, I'm on a subcommittee, or excuse me, I'm on a strategic planning committee where we have two board members on that, that subcommittee, but it's mostly made up of faculty and staff, right? So the responsibility of that board member is to then take that information and then move it to the board level, right? So that, that person or those people are helpful in engaging and getting the right questions in terms of that process. Right. Um, so I think you can keep asking, how do we know we've hit that goal? Right. Yep. What is our, our process of determining success? That's the only thing you have to say over and over again. And when they feel like they haven't really come up with some ideas, then that's precisely the moment where you can say, well, I'd love to see some data. Excellent. I've heard some things in the community anecdotally around success rates for students. Oh, I would love to be able to understand more about that. Excellent. Okay. And I think sometimes Lisa too, you know, there, if there's a feeling of, well, you know, um, you know, we're going to be handling that internally or the admin's going to do that or somebody else is going to do that. Well, then the board can still be informed of what that process was and 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 how what came about it and where where, where did they land and what led them in that place. So I think it can be this partnership, but I think I think like Mari said, asking those really strategic questions because oftentimes leaders will make very broad statements about things that are happening in the school, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's really powerful because it's so interesting that you said that. Tell me more. So how do we know that? And yeah. Mari and I do the same, you know, it's also really important. Mari and I do this with faculty and staff all the time. Well, they will tell us that students are having a particular experience in their classroom. And I will say, well, how do you know? Where, like kind of where's the evidence, right? Do you just sort of feel that or believe that to be true? Or do you have student work that shows that in the way? Or do you have a particular assessment? Or do you have particular feedback, right? That we could look at together and sort of see what's happening. So I think those specifics are really important. Um, and I think being able to ask for that spe specificity in service of things that are related to the mission, that is in the lane of a board of trustee, right? Yeah, excellent. Is there an expectation of monetary amount of a donation in order to be on the pipeline or potential for board candidacy? So most boards have to ensure that their, um, that their trustees um, are able to give at the highest level. So that does make up a large group of those who are on that list, in part because they can be leadership gifts um, and can set the stage for larger fundraising that can happen over time. Many of you know those who have money run in circles with other people who have money. Um, and so as you're thinking about how you can make connections there, 
it is one of the goals to actually understand what the giving capacity is for some board members. But depending on the culture of your school and also what it is that your board is trying to achieve, the, the statement is often that we would like for you to give at the level that is most comfortable for your family. So we want to want you to give this, that the school is your lending or excuse me, your donation priority, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that seeing that over time shows that you have a commitment, whether that is you give $100 a year, $1,000 a year, 15, 20, so on and so forth. They're looking to see commitment and ongoing connection to the school. So yes, it is a, a, a commitment and a priority. And many boards also make sure that there are other ways in which you can give back to the community. And would you say they're on par? Meaning the, that the voices around the table are on par? Yeah. <laughs> um, it depends on the board. <laughs> it really does. I mean, you know, our board um, participated in a, a two half day programming pieces around looking at their working relationships with one another, particularly mm. around um, diversity, equity and inclusion. Uh, Noni Thomas Lopez came in and did some real great work with them um, just around reflection and change. Um, and it brought up some questions about gender dynamics, racial dynamics, all of these pieces that live on board and having folks kind of come out with like some goals and some planning that they would like to see moving forward to make sure that voices are um, equally valued around the table. As I said before, there's a reason why I said there's like, there are more connections on certain committees. It's because those voices um, are often more intimately connected with the school. I mean, we're in the process of purchasing a new building right now and the people on that subcommittee are in my head of school's office pretty much once a week, which means they have proximity to power in that regard too. So, it, you know, um, there are some things about it where you may not necessarily be seen in the same way, but you have to create your own power and your own voice to enact change. Yes. Which leads to another question of how do we keep the urgency of the DEIJ importance at the same level of a new building. <laughs> when we may or may not have the ability to be in the head of school's office once a week, mm -hmm. how do we then still use our board service as a way to make sure that's top of line for meetings and always part of the conversation? Mm. Well, one thing that I, so Mari and I started out by saying the importance of aligning those diversity and equity goals with academic excellence, um, because what often happens in independent schools, and Mari and I have seen this, you know, forever, is what we say is there's sort of the regular operating of the school, here's all the things that have to get done, and then there's like the diversity and equity work <laughs> sort of over here, and every once in a while, it, they the two may cross and something happens, and um, then, then they're suddenly working together, mm -hmm. but you really want to try to work on that alignment. So part of it is, I think, really asking, does the board, you know, what is the commitment of the board to be educated um, in, 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 those, in those topics? Because we often find that people are sort of a mile wide and an inch deep on these. They don't want to come in and say, oh, I don't think diversity is a good thing, right? Or no, what's, what, what, that, what's that? That doesn't matter. I'm just, you know, reading, writing, and math, right? Like, it's not generally how folks are going to come in. But to have a deep understanding that when students feel like they belong in your school, that's when they're academic superstars, right? Um, because they're not having to be in the place of worrying about whether they should be there in sort of a freeze fight or flight moment. You know, they're they're firmly like right here doing the work that needs to get done. And so I always ask for boards, what's your time commitment? We talk about um, ELOs, equity learning opportunities. Um, to see to boards, are you setting aside time, part of a board meeting, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, every time you meet to do some learning together about this issue of equity and diversity and excellence. So to me, you know, what we value is where we put our time and our money. Um, and so being able to really look at board minutes and saying, of you, all the board minutes, how much of that is actually being devoted, right, to have a deeper understanding of the importance, let's say, of racial diversity on a campus, because we know greater racial diversity increases collaboration, makes people more creative, and it helps with problem solving. 
And if we don't need more of those things at this moment, right? But I do think it's it's counting the minutes, you know, show, and it's and it's checking the time and really seeing are we doing this learning together. So, and what would you add? Sure, I was just gonna say, and also making sure that the budgetary line is there for diversity, and that it is robust. Yep. I feel like and I just need to repeat everything you just said like ten more times. <laughs> That's perfect. That is perfect. Um, were you going to say something else? I was going to move on. Well, I was just, I was just going to add, as Mari was saying, it's a line item, but it's a line item as Mari spoke. It's, there's a line item for recruitment. There's a line item for professional development for faculty and staff. There's a line item for curricular and pedagogical innovation, right? Like there are specific things there that, as Mari and I say, correspond to the major levers that you pull in the school. Um, and if the diversity and equity is 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 right in with those things, and the board can make sure those things are embedded together, then that's what gets done. Excellent. Um, we have a request for you to talk about navigating the role of a parent and a trustee. Not so easy to do. <laughs> It's important to separate out what your student's experience has been on campus from what your role is in the business of the board. Um, so very hard to do. So very hard not to ask key questions, particularly if your child or you see other friends of your child suffering. Um, but it is important to maintain the distance while you're on the board in part because if you do that really well, it gives you a larger opening to talk directly to the head of school when you are having problems. So if you maintain a level of neutrality, thoughtful engagement, doesn't mean you can't also be frustrated and articulate that, particularly as it, you know, as it you know, relates to a particular issue, but it's important to show that, um, that level of calm and engagement so that then you can leverage other conversations in a different way. I think the other piece too um, is to think about, like Maury said, for that moment, for that term, you are on the board and that is gonna be your prior priority and moving forward. But if you are lucky enough to have a partner or another family member, um, you know, part of it is that I have seen families successfully have one parent is trustee who's holding that line. And then when things come up with the student having another family member or connected person who comes in and sort of advocates for the student on a more day to day level or other things that need to be happening that way so that there's kind of clear lanes that way. So you still feel like your child has that particular advocate that they need to have in those moments, but you can still maintain um, the distance that I think is, is required when you just sign up for being a trustee. It is a decision that you have to make. And it, it is, it, there, that is a, it's not a cost, but um, it, it is something that you have to be really thoughtful about. Excellent. Um, we have someone on the call who wants to introduce the notion of DEI accreditation or auditing to their board. They're wondering if you have any suggestions for resources. Well, <laughs> well, let me just say this. Um, I don't, you know what, I haven't looked at their instrument in a while, Elizabeth, but um, when we were in DC, we were affiliated with um, the Association of Independent Schools of Maryland in DC. Um, and they worked really hard to have a foundational part of the school accreditation process be connected to issues of equity and justice. Um, and many associations have tried to in, um, include that in their work. Um, and so that's been one of the ways I would tell you that you can leverage change within a school. So because if your um, accrediting body says that you have some major issues that you need to work on, then it's through that that then the school has to prioritize that by the time they come back for their five year or by the time they come back for their 10 year. So how much progress can they show over time that they've been able to accomplish? So one thing you should understand is that there are things that in the ether supposedly for independent schools that you can use to try to move the work forward. In terms of an audit process, we've worked with, uh, there are a lot of different organizations, including Elizabeth's organization that has gone into schools 
Um, ESET has gone into schools and said, let me look at this, let me see the construction of what it is you're doing and, um, and engage with it and determine whether or not it feels on par with what it is that you say you want to achieve. I, I will say that oftentimes I think schools are not looking at the data they have. <laughs> and sometimes there's, or they want somebody else to come in and maybe find something else. So I think also really, if you are thinking about going into some kind of an audit process, really talking to other trustees about how that process went and, and what happened, did they get out of it what they wanted to get out of that? Um, you know, sometimes uh, trying to work with internal feedback that you may have and then structuring a plan out of that with an outside consultant sometimes can be more helpful. Um, external audits are very expensive and they are very time consuming. Um, and so really having to think about, is that the best place? Do you sort of have the data that you need? Do you sort of know what's going on? You just need somebody to help you put a plan moving forward. And I think those are two very different, two very different things. Can you guys talk a little bit more about accreditation? Because that was a new concept for me. Um, and I believe there are ways for parents to volunteer to be a part of that. Hmm. I'm, you know what? I, I'm not sure. I know that. Okay. Well, let me say this. Every year, uh, or not every year, every 10 years, um, schools, independent schools have to go through an accreditation process uh, with their association. Um, it is an arduous and time consuming process, and it often results in a 200 plus page document. Part of it is actually looking at your board of trustees and the composition within your board, as well as other key constituent bodies, the parent association, um, uh, school and community, curriculum and development, extracurriculars, it has different uh, parts to it. Um, that report is often constructed by a team of individuals. Um, and often different people are um, ascribed to committees to be able to get their portions done. And then they often come to me, unfortunately, and I have to then take everything that they've written, make sure that it aligns, make sure that the voice is consistent, and to really make sure that it is, um, in fact, what that committee was trying to communicate. So oftentimes parents um, and board members can be involved in that. Um, and then what happens is that when that report is submitted, the association then sends in a team of people that then go and interview different constituents to be able to see whether or not the, the, um, the report that you produced aligns with what they hear in the community. And so they will often talk to members of the board of trustees. In fact, they typically have to. Um, they talk to your audit committees. They talk to faculty. They talk to students. They talk to key constituents to try to understand more about what it is. So one of the things that you can do and what I've seen many schools do is make sure that there are people on your committee who come to visit you that have a certain expertise. Mm -hmm. So I know Elizabeth and I have often been requested by schools, can you come and be a part? So I've even uh, been, uh, even after I moved to Philadelphia, I was on a, um, an accreditation team for a school in Baltimore who requested me. So it's, it really is trying to make sure that you get some eyes and ears um, into the school community where we think we can figure out maybe there's something there that people aren't talking about and trying to put it front and center. And also many schools, particularly if they don't feel like they have a uh, what's the word I want to use, like a cultural hold on what it is that they want to do, that they're not sure that uh, the community is ready for what they know they have to do as a school. Um, between us, often a school administration will feed certain information to a, um, a committee and say, please highlight these areas in our report. Because that gives the school more permission to move forward on certain initiatives where they might have some resistance among faculty or around parents or things like that. They can say, look, our association is requiring us to do this. And so it's another way to move the community forward. But are you not being a good trustee if you then bring to um, a creditor's attention anything that maybe, I don't know wouldn't be one of those message points that the school would want you to necessarily push. I mean, well, where's I, the finesse in that, I guess I'm wondering. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I'm all about asking questions. Yeah. 
you know. So I'm wondering, um, you know, as you all are having conversations with the school, um, I want to make sure you understand what my commitment has been around these particular topics in the institution. I hope that that is in alignment with what you're seeing in the board report and what you're hearing from others. Or even asking, again, this is not a question for the committee, but asking the school and those who are running the accreditation, who has been invited to the team and who are they going to talk to? Because the other thing is that they can often pull together a group of kids that they know are going to give the committee the answer they want in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And so asking questions like, it, uh, is the visiting team going to have the opportunity to meet with a wide variety of students? Will they be meeting with a group of students of color? Will they be meeting with um, both ninth and 10th, you know, younger children and older children, right? So mm -hmm. putting all those asking all those questions coming forward. What's the only tricky thing I will say about independent school accreditation, the process is that, you know, you create your self-evaluation as Mari said, and then people come in to see if the thing you said is actually what's going on. So it's a little bit different than saying like an outside board comes in and evaluates. They are certainly looking for alignment. But accreditation teams come on your campus for like two or three days. Um, they come with a mass of people. They are talking to as many people as they can. They are generating their own report. So they are writing as they're coming forward. It's very intense. So they are coming in to get a snapshot. But as Mari said, it is one of those important places where again, the schools, I mean, it is, I mean, certainly there are independent schools that are not accredited, but they are few and far between. And so accreditation means things. Um, it, it is meaningful and folks want to hold on to that. So it's a really important point of leverage. You do not want to be on the side. You do not want to be the board that loses your school's accreditation, right. you know, so you, you want to do that well. So it is, it's another one of those uh, strategic moments and it's a really important inflection point in the life of a school. And you do realize Mariama just um, said that people request both of you guys. <laughs> yeah. Are yeah. you sure you just said that out loud? I mean, it's the truth. I mean, do I have time to do it all the way with another? <laughs> no, but yes, we do. But yeah, but we get out. Yeah. Note to self. Um, yes. Okay. Our head of school seems to have an interesting relationship with our board. Mm. Many, it may, it seems like they are afraid to stand up to anything he doesn't already support. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about the board dynamics? Our new trustees, as a new trustee, how do I help change the board culture? Well, I mean, <laughs> let me start off by saying that sometimes um, heads of school stack their boards. Um, they will stack them with people that are often agreeable, um, who they know are looking to leverage their power position within the school, possibly. Um, and it's not healthy when that happens. Um, and so, <laughs> again, I feel like the, the best way forward, Elizabeth, help me here. I think it's just asking the right questions, right? Yeah, and I, and I think it's also you know, where I think one thing that is really good to remember that as the board of trustees, you are the boss of the head of school. I mean, the head of school reports to the board of trustees. So, you know, like anybody who's working for you, I think you want to make sure they're doing what they need to do and they're having the feedback they need to have. So part of it is, um, are you really clear in what the priorities are for the head of school in a particular year. Um, again, you know, really making sure that you're really clear on what the head is supposed to be working on. That's been clearly articulated and that should be navigated with the board and the head to set those priorities. And then the head should be coming back and checking in every board meeting with how it's going on the particular strategic priorities that the head has for that year. Um, and there should be a really nice alignment on that. So I think if you're not noticing that nobody's giving feedback, it might have to say, so what are our head's priorities for the year? And again, this whole notion of data, how will we know if the head is doing what we have asked them to do? What, what are going to be our measurement tools 
What are we going to be looking at? What data is the head going to be bringing forward? So I think, again, it's really specific questions, making sure the head, I, I you know, it's, it's really kind of a recipe for a disaster when a head walks in and has like 10 goals for the year, because nobody is going to do 10 things well. But a head of school can do two or three things really, really well and dive in and focus. So I think making sure that the head's um, goals and priorities are clearly articulated, they're manageable, and there's evidence that can be brought forward, and you just got to keep asking for that. But, you know, that's, you know, the head's working for you. I mean, you want it to be a symbiotic relationship, right? You want, you really want, it's the head and the board relationship, especially the chair of trust of the chair of the board is very, very important because those folks are walking shoulder to shoulder um, to lead the school. But there are also should be some healthy tension there in the notion that that both the head is going to be held accountable to the board and the board has a real accountability to the head and his leadership team to make sure that they can lead the school in an effective way. So you mentioned the board chair. Um, we have a question here. How important is it to be on the executive committee of a board and how does one position themselves for that service? Hmm. Well, I, I will say, you know, executive committee, again, will be dictated by the bylaws and it will be by, it's usually by position. Um, so if you are the secretary or you are the treasurer or you are the vice chair, or whatever it may be. So, I mean, I think once you get on the board, knowing which, which of those officers sits on the executive committee and maybe starting to see what's usually nice is executive committee will have a mix of representation on there. It, they are looking for folks who hold very different roles. And I think immediately starting to see, huh, could I see myself as the secretary, could I see myself as treasurer? Where where could I think I could best leverage? So knowing exactly who sits on that committee um, and then envisioning what might be the best role for you. Go ahead. Depending Mark. on the school also, if you've been on a subcommittee for a while, you rotate into that leadership. Um, and so it can also be around kind of when you get to that position and then how that moves you onto the executive committee. Um, the executive committee gets a lot more information than the whole board. Like, let me just be very clear. Yes. Um, because in moments of crisis, if there are big decisions that have to be made, um, for instance, we've got to change our bank because something's happening or, you know, that is the subcommittee that's brought together to make that decision when there is no board meeting on the horizon. Um, that is the same group of people that may be called in in the summer when there are things that are happening and there has to be a decision. And they're also the people that often will look over the agenda for the retreats. Um, so they do actually have a say in prioritizing what it is that the board will focus on. Excellent. Last question. Is there any best practice related to, and I think one of you mentioned this earlier, related to um, the interfacing between trustees and parents? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, as trustee, you are the keeper of the mission, you are standing, you are a stand in for the institution in different places. So I think recognizing that when parents want to bring issues to you or other things that are happening, or when you're speaking to parents, <laughs> it's not just you, um, but really thinking you are carrying that mantle of the board. And so if you are a board member and you try to share something and I say, well, Lisa, I'm just going to, you know, tell you this. Well, the next thing you may hear is, well, we heard the board, you know, thinks this, and that was really just the personal opinion of Elizabeth. So I think when you are with other parents, you do have to maintain that piece of recognizing you do, you don't give, you can't sort of take off your board hat mm -hmm. um, with other parents. I don't think so. Um, I think that can be a really hard line um, and that you are representing the institution. And so I think making sure that if questions come before you or things you're wondering about, it may have to be like, oh, great. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much for that question. You know what? I'm going to let me talk to a few of my colleagues on the board and I'll get back to you. Uh, sort of not speaking off the cuff or bringing other things forward. If there are legit parent um, concerns, very often board members are the first people parents will go to. And oftentimes parents will skip over classroom teacher, division director, assistant head of school, head of school, 
and jump right to trustee. And I think you have to really know the chain of command. And if somebody comes forward and they're reaching out to you, you know, to say, huh, it's so interesting you're reaching out to me on this level as a board member. Can you tell me a little bit about how you arrived on me? Did you talk to the division director? Have you talked to the head of school, right? So you've got to be really mindful of that, of that positionality. And really coming to the board is the last stop in a way. Um, it should not be the first stop. And how do you redirect and get questions or concerns from parents going back in the right direction so they can be handled at the place that's appropriate? Can I also say this also counts for your partner or spouse too? Because you have to make sure that, because people think you're they're connected and as a result they know something that other people don't. Yeah. Um, so it also has to be a collective decision for you as a family about what are some of the things you're going to do and not do. Um, I think when there is an engagement between board and parents, it should often be in the context of them understanding more, but not necessarily responding. Mm, yes. um, and again, that's that was my earlier point about saying how you show up in the boardroom helps you to have a better beeline to the folks in power when necessary. It's also important to note that yes, you get access to the, to the um, head of school, but on board, you also get access to other senior administrators, right? So you get access to the director of development who often is the chair of the governance committee. So they understand more about the pipeline and who's up there. And the board often solicits from the board, who do you think we should be considering, right? So you have access to that way to get other people on the board who you think will be really valuable. You have access to often, well, it depends on their leadership team, but you also have access to say the director of diversity. You then have more access um, you know, in my case, our division heads are not on the board of trustees, but I am as a representative of the academic program of the school. So you get that beeline and access to some of the other senior partners within the institution, which can be just as important as having access to the head of school. Ladies, you guys have dropped some major gems. Diver what did you say? Until we recognize that diversity equals academic excellence. I think I'm gonna like brand that somewhere. <laughs> and the cost of inequality, um, just gems. Um, I'm wondering if you have any final thoughts, particularly for our community, which is made up of current trustees, as well as those who are vying to serve. Yeah. I mean, I I just want more Black families to get on boards. So I feel like any way you can find that you can get on and do it, please do. And I, I say this to Lisa all the time, but know how lucky your school is to have you. Um, yes, you're happy to be part of the community and to be connected and you're great and you love having your kid or kids in the school, but the school is lucky to have you too. And a way to really sort of cement that relationship and really be able to be an advocate in what I think are some of the most powerful ways is electing to be on the board of trustees. And you may not see a lot of other people who look like you, but I say go and bring three friends with you. And every time they ask for, well, who should we be talking to about joining the board? Have your list ready um, and slide it and get your friends to volunteer to be room parents and to help chair the fall festival. Anytime there's an opportunity um, for black families to lead in any capacity of the school, that's the, that's the pipeline to the board. Um, they are looking at parent volunteers. So you and your three friends chair the spring fling or whatever it is, right? Like get in there, get known. Um, and it's just a, it's been a pleasure to be with you all tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having us, Lisa. Thank you. I would just close by saying um, this is slightly off topic, but um, I would also just help people have a deeper understanding, an understanding of how you're more powerful in the group sometimes than as an individual. Um, and one of the ways in which we've seen real power leverage within the communities is when our Black parents have gotten together and said, this is what we're going to do, right? Um, when we were at Georgetown Day School, there was a group of Black parents who collectively put all of their annual gifts into one pot and said, we want to pay for the naming of this diversity office, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of Black families um, in my current school, some of them on this call, um, who really created the first opportunity for our families, um, but in particular, our Black families to come together 
um, on the beach, on the edge of trying to be healthy and safe around COVID that created some of the most impactful um, and important gatherings that the school has had in recent years. These are really key moments. And I think when we start to show schools what our collective power is, that's when they start to understand how, it's, how important it is to have members of our community then on those boards. So as a future independent school mom, my kid is in the application process and I keep going back and forth on my feelings about it, but, <laughs> but I'm here with you all and a member of the community. So again, thank you so much for having us. Thank you ladies for being here. Everyone out there, thank you also for joining us. We did record tonight. It will be on our YouTube channel um, in a few days. Look for the email with the link in it. And please also look for our email uh, after the Thanksgiving break about the continuation of our new trustee leadership program. And if you are not already convinced, we need you. <laughs> so please, uh, please stay engaged. Tell your friend, bring, more, bring two more friends. And, uh, and let's create the pipeline so that when and if we are asked, we are ready with our list <laughs> and we are ready to hit the ground running. Thank you so much. <laughs>